to break me out And he could change my life and set me free I'm so glad that someone came over He met me I was lost and alone in a world where No peace of mind or freedom could I see What little did I know I had a friend somewhere Someone I didn't know Somebody prayed They had me on their mind They sacrificed their time They got down on their knees And prayed for me They had me on their mind They tried to bring me up And he could change my life And set me free I'm so glad that someone prayed for me squeaked it out there this morning, but we got it. Amen. Somebody prayed for me. They had me on their mind, and Lord God, that's the truth. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, you'd open them to Luke chapter 22. We're going to start at verse 21. Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 21. And when you found the text, if you'd stand with us this morning. In honor of the reading of God's word, praise God, amen. Luke 22, beginning at verse 21, and the King James reads, But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table, and truly the Son of Man goeth, as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves, which of them it was that should do this thing? And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest? And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table and in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Master, we love you, God, today. We love your word above all else. We're so grateful, God, for this opportunity right now to break the bread of life and to receive from it the nourishment that our soul needs. God, there's nothing that I can offer anyone outside of the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and therefore, Lord, I implore you, 
Allow your anointing and your presence to flow at this hour. God, those that are in this room are not the only ones that will hear this message, but there are those by internet, there are those that will receive tapes. God, hundreds and hundreds of people that hear our messages, everyone that's preached. And Jesus, today, if anyone will be benefited, if anyone will be served and helped by this message, it will only be by your spirit. And we just pray this hour that you'd loose your spirit through your word. God, speak to hearts and move and uh, inspire and encourage hearts today. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Amen. You know, <clears throat> the Lord had a little conversation with Peter shortly before he was to be crucified. And the Lord spoke with Peter and said, Peter, Satan hath desired to have you, but I have prayed for you. And then he goes on to say that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted... What a positive statement Jesus is making to Peter. He's assuming Peter's going to fall, but he's not going to stay down. He's assuming Peter is going to experience a failure, but he is not going to allow that to cripple him and keep him down. You see, the Lord might very well have said to Peter that day, Peter... Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, but I believe in you. Hallelujah. And that's what I'm talking about this morning. He believes in me. Glory to God. I want you to know today, God believes in his people. We generally focus in our faith uh, in the fact that we believe in God for our salvation. But there is a far greater relationship that we can have with the Lord. Not when we are saying, I believe in God, but rather when we come to understand that God believes in us. Hallelujah. That's why I believe Peter uh, was hearing from Jesus that day what amounted to the words, Peter, I believe in you. Amen. Do you remember the story of Job in Job chapter 1 verses 6 through uh, 8? how that the Bible said that the angels of God appeared before God and they all presented themselves and Satan also appeared before the Lord and the word of God says and the Lord said unto Satan in verse 8 of Job chapter 1 and the Lord said unto Satan hast thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. My friend, I would present to you this morning, I believe with all my heart what God was saying to Satan that day was, do you know my servant Job? I believe in him. Hallelujah. I've got confidence in him. I believe that when all hell busts loose, he'll still do the right thing. I believe if he fell flat on his face, he'd get up and keep marching. He'd keep striving for the prize. He'd keep pushing to reach the goal. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I want you to know this morning, children, the greatest cheerleader that you have in your life and the greatest cheerleader that I have in my life is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. If you remember, as Stephen was being stoned that day, how that Saul stood by the side taking the coats of those who had stoned him. And the Bible said, Pete, uh, Stephen looked up and said, I see Jesus standing. Hallelujah. He was cheering Stephen home, glory to God. He stood up off the throne and said, Stephen, come on home, baby. I believe in you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Whew. If more churches would let God's people know that God believes in them, we'd have less backsliders and more victory. Hallelujah. If more preachers would preach that God believes in them. See, I'm going to tell you, I don't believe backsliding is defined the way a lot of preachers define backsliding. I don't believe because you grow discouraged 
I don't believe because you become despondent with what's going on in the church. I don't believe that qualifies you as a backslider. I don't believe even if you do something stupid. I don't believe even if you do something sinful that you have necessarily backslidden. Your faith hadn't failed. Jesus said to Peter that day, he said, Peter, I've prayed for you. What? That you won't do something stupid? That you won't fail? That you won't falter? No. He said that your faith fail not. Hallelujah. So my friend, whatever your actions have been, whatever your deeds have been, wherever you've gone and whatever you've done, that doesn't matter this morning. What matters is that your faith Fail not, hallelujah, and hold on to that faith with everything you've got inside of your spirit. Glory to God. If ever there was a story of a backslider, it's found in, in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. That's the story of the prodigal son as we know him. And Jesus said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth me. And he divided them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And when he had spent all, there... Uh, Excuse me. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy servants. And he arose and came to his father. This boy must have believed in his dad. Yes, Come on now. He must have had confidence in his dad. But you know, there's more to this story. Listen now. <laughs> but when he was yet a great way off, Itamaraso, his father saw him. Oh, somebody had some faith in the son. <laughs> Somebody believed that son would find it in his heart to do the right thing. Somebody believed that boy would come home one day because instead of being in the backyard mowing, he was on the front porch watching. Hallelujah! So the son had confidence in the father, but my friend, the father, believed in his son. Glory to God. And I want you to know today, God believes in you. He believes that when you've strayed and when you've erred, you'll find your way home again. He believes you'll make every effort to get back to the Father's house. Because, my friend, I've got news for you. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, no matter what uh, your past has been, no matter what the last few years or months have been, the reality is this, just like this prodigal son, he said, in my father's house, he's still your father. You don't have to be living at home for God still to be your father. You don't have to be going to church for God to still be your father. You don't have to be doing all the things that some churches say that you're supposed to be doing for God to still be your father. Oh, friend, wake up this morning. Come on now. Look up and realize in your father's house is everything you need. Glory to God. All you have to do is come on home. It's there for you. It's ready. It's prepared. Glory to God. And God will not accept you as a servant. Once you're a son, you are always a son. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Whew, I don't know about you, but this is good news where I come from. Amen. <laughs> 
we believe in preaching good news. The Bible said gospel means good news. I don't know about you, but this sounds like good news to me. I want you to know if that prodigal son's father didn't believe in his son, why in the world would he have been waiting for him? Looking down the driveway, looking down the roadway while he was yet afar off. He believed in him enough. Tommy, I believe that he stepped out off the porch. He probably did it 30 or 40 or 50 or 80 times before that boy came home. But how many days did that father believe in that son and come down off that porch and walk down that driveway and start to walk down the road toward the big city where he knew his son had gone? How many times did he start to make that walk expecting, anticipating, I'll see my son today. Hallelujah. And day after day after day he didn't see him but he didn't stop believing glory to God just because you didn't come home yesterday God's looking for you today glory to God he's still looking he's still walking down the driveway he's still walking down the street and he's looking to see you in the distance my Lord have mercy God believes in you this morning he believes you can make it he believes you can keep the faith. He believes you can endure to the end. He believes enough in you to have invested his great Holy Ghost in you. Children rejoice this morning, not in the fact that we believe in the Father, but rather that the Father believes in us. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. In Acts chapter 19, verses 13 to 17, we read a little story. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. I'm going to tell you a little secret this morning. The devil knows who God has confidence in. You hear me now? Jesus I know. Paul I know. <laughs> the devil knows who God believes in. Come on now. He knows better than to argue with those of us who not only know God in truth, but those that God knows in truth. Hallelujah. I want you to know today. I've told you before on many occasions, especially living in New York City, I'd walk on a subway sometimes and somebody would be sitting in a, and they weren't homeless and disheveled and, you know, looked like something out of a scary movie. But all of a sudden, boy, they just turned their head to me and their eyes would about half closed and they say, I know you, stay away from me. I know you, stay away from me. I know you, stay away from me. Because that demon knows. Those devils know when God believes in somebody. There's a lot of people believe in God. They can't cast out devils. But it's people that God believes in who can. <laughs> Hello now. It's people that God believes in. It's people that God can put confidence in. It's people that God can put trust in who are able to do the job. Hallelujah. If you read in Revelation chapter 2 verses 8 through 11, look what the Lord says to the church at Smyrna. And under the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. Oh, gee, there's a... Right there we kind of call into question the uh, prosperity doctrine, don't we? Because the Lord acknowledges to the church at Smyrna that in terms of earthly things they're poor. In terms of spiritual things, they're rich. 
he said, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. I want you to know today, Jesus was speaking to the church at Smyrna and saying to them, I believe in you. I believe you have what it takes to overcome. I believe you have what it takes to be victorious. I believe you have what it takes to endure the hardship as a good soldier that will be visited upon you in the last days to be known by God and to have earned his confidence is by no means an easy road to travel. The Bible said, Yea, all they that will live godly shall suffer persecution. It's not an easy road just because God knows you and has confidence in you. That doesn't make everything sweet. It doesn't make, you know, a water slide. It's still a journey. It's still a difficult travel, a difficult road. But listen, the rewards on this road are plentiful. Amen. It's a very rewarding journey that we take. The Word of God says in Luke chapter 9 and verse 1, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. That sounds like a pretty exciting road to travel to me, doesn't it? Amen. Matthew 10, 7 and 8. And as ye go, Jesus said, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Glory to God. Mom, I've been on this Pentecostal road my whole life and I love it. Amen. There's nothing more exciting than to see God deliver a demoniac from a, uh, from a bondage that is worse than mental illness, that is worse than physical illness. There's nothing more exciting than to see God heal somebody and cause their bent limbs to straighten and watch them stand up out of their wheelchair for the first time in 30 or 40 years. I've been there, I've done it, I've seen it. Believe me when I tell you, God can do it. And if God, uh, if we can just believe in God enough so that he can return the favor and believe in us, we'll see these things happening right here in Jubilee Fellowship. Glory to God. I'm here to tell you it's not an easy road, but it's an exciting one. Amen. It's a very exciting one. See God heal cancers and tumors and deliver people from all manner of sickness and disease. All because we ask him. Amen. Psalm chapter 103 verses 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. I'm talking about this great road we got to travel. It's fraught with benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things. So that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Oh children I want you to know today. The Lord has. He must have invested a great deal of trust in us because he's given us such power and such authority. Amen. He's given us power over unclean spirits. He's given us authority over sickness and disease. Don't tell me my God doesn't believe in me. He wouldn't give somebody he doesn't believe in that kind of ability. Amen. I want to tell you today, there's a story in scripture of a man that also had Two sons, like those found in the story of the prodigal son, Matthew 21, 28 through 32. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. And went not. 
Whether of them twain did the will of his father, they say unto him the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Amen. Did you hear that, Steve? Yeah. Publicans and harlots get into the kingdom of God before you. That's what Jesus said. That's not what Brother Morris said. That's what Jesus said. Now listen, he goes on to say, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterwards, that ye might believe him. Oh, children, I want you to know today, God believes in us. But he asks us to go do the work, and we answer him, No, Dad, I've got other things to do. In his heart, the Lord is saying, He'll find his way back. He'll do what I've asked him to do. He'll make his way to the vineyard to do what I have asked of him because he's a good son. I believe in him. Or a good daughter, I believe in her. My question this morning is, are we walking today worthy of the master's confidence? Is he able to place his trust in us? Or are we still hoping to make heaven on the strength of our confidence in him? Can the Lord count on you and I to return to the task at hand? Or have we established a reputation as quitters and disobedient? True faith in God results in God's faith in us. When we place our full and complete confidence in God's grace, not trying to win or earn our salvation with man-made teachings and arbitrary standards, we come to possess not only confidence in God, but we come to possess God's confidence in us. Amen. Are you blessed this morning? Was that an encouraging word? Would you stand with me? Amen. It was a nice short word of exhortation this morning. He believes in me. Remember that the next time the devil tries to kick you around. Amen. Remember that the next time the enemy tries to discourage your soul and just say, devil, you know what? My God believes in me. Amen. He believes in me. He's got confidence in me. Just like he said to Peter that day, Peter, you're going to fall, but that's all right when you get back up. Why would he say that? Because he believed in Peter. <laughs> he had confidence in Peter. Amen. Glory to God and amen. I'll tell you what, uh, Steve, why don't you close first with prayer, would you? Uh, God, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.